All right, folks. Uh, time to stop enjoying your uh, well in earned break. Uh, I've already given you five minutes extra time, so it's time to find your seat and get us going with the rest of the program. Um, we're again facing four uh, interesting talks. Uh, we'll be beginning uh, with talk from uh, Olaf Hoerfeld. Uh, he works at Sadoma Games uh, as a director. And uh, that's about it. Uh, Olaf is going to be running about 25 minutes. And then uh, as our uh, schedule got shifted about 10 minutes, also for the information of those people who were staring at a blank screen at YouTube, uh, you'll know that we'll be finishing a little bit l later than expected because I'm still going to give the time uh, the people deserve uh, for them. So, please, Olaf, thank you for, for coming. Okay, so I'm Olaf from uh, Sanoma Games, and uh, I won't spend a lot of time you know, explaining who I am, really, uh, because this will be pretty intense. My intent is not that you will uh, sort of get everything I show you here. It's more about like kind of getting ideas, maybe be inspired a bit. Uh, and I have put this presentation as it is right here on SlideShare, so you can find it. So uh, because there will be quite a lot of stuff, really. So basically, who I am? Um, I'm a um, master of science from Malta University, industrial engineering. I have loved numbers and optimization, analytics and stuff, practically always. Um, that's why I call myself a bit of a pragmatic optimizer. Uh, I spent a few years in management consulting, and now I, for a few years, I've been with. Uh, uh, Sanoma Games at Sanoma Media Finland. So I'm the director of the unit and uh, basically Sanoma Games which is the context in which I will talk about um, building a data-driven culture now. So basically this is the context that I've been working with this with my team. So quickly Sanoma Games, what Sanoma Games is, we're basically Finland's largest casual gaming sites operator, uh, largest operator of fantasy sports games which is basically paid consumer games. So if you know those of you who play hockey, you might know Liga Persi and Hockey GM, hockey GM and these games. So we, we run those games. Pelicon and Alupa are casual gaming portals uh, that are under Ilta Sanoma. We reach around 800,000 people on a monthly basis from our casual games, and we have some 75, 80,000 paying users in our fantasy sports games. So we have quite a bit of uh, data to, to sort of work with. Not quite Vekos, but, but kind of enough to do some sensible stuff. Uh, we're an autonomous unit, which is very special within Sanoma. That is the map of the Vatican, which is we are sometimes referred to. And I kind of think that's pretty cool. And uh, that's for the fact that we have everything in, within our own unit. So we have business, marketing, product management, development, design, everything. We're 16 people, and we have basically all we need in the team. This is a key thing to, to note now that I talk about uh, this culture thing, because uh, this was on Lassie's slide in the beginning, and uh, I just want to point out that this is really the key uh, in this, from the cultural aspect, is how you get these things to really work together. It's really about that piece in the middle, because if you do, you know, only design, but don't think about the business, you won't live for very long. You might have awesome stuff, but it just doesn't work for a very long time. And uh, same thing with analytics. Analytics standalone is worthless because it's, it becomes data porn and, and it's, it's nice, but it's no utility to the rest of the, world, of, of the circles here. So it's really about the thing in the middle. And uh, one profound thing that I believe in at least is that in order to have a business, you need to have a kick-ass user experience. Not everybody sort of thinks this way, uh, but I believe that first you need to make sure to provide excellent user experience. People actually wanting what you do, having utility in it. Then it might turn into a business that doesn't work automatically. But that's the profound uh, requirement in order to have a business. Look at Google. They didn't have a clue about how to make money, but they made an awesome, useful service. It took years for them to figure it out. OK, so let's, uh, let's just quickly say what data-drivenness is not. It's not introducing a tool. It's not about just bringing a tool. Hey, guys, now we have this analytics tool. Go try it out. That creates absolutely nothing. And since you're wondering, that would be a handheld uh, USB snake scope. I just tried to find a weird tool. One other thing to note is that introducing a tool won't get you anywhere. But also, uh, when I think of culture, I'm really talking about involving everyone. It's about a, a sort of way of thinking, way of working. So if you, introduce, if you hire two data guys, or if you say, yeah, we have a big data team, that doesn't 
create a data-driven culture. That is useful in itself, yes, but that's not a data-driven culture. So what I will talk about um, is basically what is a data-driven culture and uh, what it sort of uh, is made of. So basically, I'll let this sink in for a bit. This is my temple of data-drivenness, as I see it. My point here is data-drivenness, I don't know if that's a word, but I will use it, um, is really based, it, it needs a lot of other things around it. A data-driven culture cannot really be you know, as itself. So if we can conclude that, bring tools, bring you know, one data scientist, doesn't help. Well, bring a culture, yeah, that helps. But what about all the stuff that's around it that's necessary? So that's what I'll, I'll focus on now. And I'll go through each of these real quick um, to give an idea of how I think about it. So let's start with organization supporting lean development. Most of you, I bet, have read this book. It's like the Bible of, of development, at least in digital. So I won't spend a lot of time in explaining what a minimum viable demo is or a minimum viable product. But basically, this is the, the, the whole sort of essence of the thinking of the development. One point is that a minimum viable product is a concept that can be used with product features, but also a uh, whole business concept, okay? So, but in order to be lean, use the lean business development practices, you need to have an organization that actually, or orchestration of you know, people and, and, and doing that supports it really. So in order to have this continuous build, measure, learn cycle, that's so key to the whole lean mentality, uh, you really need to make sure that there's no friction in, in working, in doing. And coming from a large organization, which is awesome, Sanoma Media Finland, uh, we obviously have a lot of people. And we have, you know, it's orchestrated in a different way. We have some media, we have like the tabloid, the news, the TV, and then we have some cross functions like central sales, centralized sales, centralized marketing, the big data team, and you can kind of see maybe where this is going. So in order to have a very, really lean uh, development, you need to have the people working on it really seamlessly working on that, dedicated, and not scattering their attention on you know, five other projects, or so that in order to have something done, you need to write a ticket and wait for two weeks for it to come back. That doesn't support a quick build, measure, learn cycle. I'm not saying um, you know, this is the, st the standard way of working. I'm just saying that in order to be lean, you really need to ensure the, prere the sort of prerequisites to be lean. So you have the people really focused and everybody involved. And that's what I wanted to uh, point out about games, being specific in the sense that we have all the sort of functions we need in our own team. OK. So you need to have that. Otherwise, you will probably have more difficulty succeeding. Management fostering self-direction. OK, this is more like maybe leadership philosophy. Uh, but I really believe in these sort of three cornerstones uh, as a necessity for efficient uh, data-drivenness, transparency, autonomy, and ownership. And I'll just quickly explain what I mean with this. Transparency, I mean basically that, that we, people understand what we're doing. And I'm not saying that people are, are dumb or ignorant. I'm just saying that in a lot of businesses, it's not necessarily clear what, how the business actually works. So our business is to, to make create sales, right, revenue. But what is it made of? This example is from media sales. This is a product where you have content, in our case, it's games. It's monetized through advertising. If we reduce the whole cake to only look at advertising, right? So this is an example from that. A real example when we needed to really take a look at, at optimizing this stuff. OK, so my point is that really show how does this work? What is the breakdown structure of what we're doing? And as, as here, uh, show what components it's made of and show the interrelations between the components and also how each of them contributes. So that in this example, um, for those of you in, in sort of media sales, you know these, these like how, how this works. But for instance, video campaign volume, how that affects our sales. There's a lot of campaigns, how does that, that affect? If there's less, if there's less premium, fill, uh, premium, then the fill rate will be lower. That means remnant will rise and so forth. It's really how the sort of machine works. So if you, if you want the team to really fine tune the whole engine, uh, people need to know how it works. OK, then this, autonomy and mastery. This is really assuming that you have people who really want to do a good job. They like what they're doing, which I'm fortunate to have a team who, who do. Then I see data-driven as really like this. It's still you. It's still you, a designer, a marketer, a business person, doing what you like to learn and do, and you're doing a good job. 
being data-driven is kind of a power-up. You're still doing what you do. You just do it. You just kick ass even more at doing it. And this, has a, this as I see it, means that you cannot, you cannot sort of bring a data-driven culture by coercion. You cannot force people to. You cannot say, you know, be data-driven. It needs to come from visibly showing, really, hey, this is how you are better at your job that you love by being data-driven. That's how you, through you know, intrinsic motivation or, or what you want to call it, uh, get people to really adopt the way of thinking uh, data-drivenly. OK. Ownership is basically more about taking ownership of what you do, not sort of merely uh, delivering stuff that has been sort of ordered or agreed. And, uh, and this is how I see, how I see sort of ownership in, in our own team. Uh, and and but one, one key thing is that you should make a distinction between benefits and deliverables, which is, I mean, standard stuff most of the time. But if you take an example, a deliverable might be creating a mobile app for one of our fantasy sports games. Yeah, that's a deliverable. Somebody's responsible for that mobile app. But what that person should really be responsible for is the benefit we seek, so that people can play with real-time data. Push notifications is really important in this app. That's the benefit that we're after, not the app itself. So really having people owning the benefit, not the deliverable, is a, it might seem trivial, but, but it's, it's really what, as I see it, ownership is about. That really fosters self-direction. And that's when you don't need to hassle that much. So uh, having gone through what, as I see it, the sort of what's needed as a platform for data-drivenness, uh, I'll just uh, take a few examples of what data-driven culture might be. Now, I, I'm not claiming to be an authority on this. I, I don't want to lecture. These are my thoughts. I'm really sort of, uh, I like this topic. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with this for a few years now. As I see it, data-drivenness, like any creative work, is about reflection. It's about thinking, right? You cannot script it. You cannot create rules. You cannot standardize it. It's, it's a way of thinking. You cannot be, go tell somebody, be creative. This is how you do it, right? But you can introduce some key concepts, some key sort of guidelines, and that's Moses. So about sort of how to steer it to help. Because creativity is best when constrained, I believe. And uh, by telling, you know, be data-driven or think, think about this won't really help either. Bring some, some sort of guidelines and concepts. OK, and then one really key thing uh, is to be hypothesis-driven. In, in, in whatever sort of how you do it, uh, what you apply it to, but be hypothesis driven. Because really, if you just go around and do random experimentation, which experimentation is really an important part of being lean, try stuff, yes, but do it sort of in a sensible way. So be hypothesis driven, meaning basically that you have something that you have an idea, it could be whatever. How do I state this so that I can test it in a way that it's either validated or false? OK, so an example, hypothesis. And one of the earliest uh, hypotheses actually at games, it was even before my time, was that we had pre-roll advertising, which is basically when a, when a game loads, it's, it says it's loading. Well, it's already loaded, of course, but it gives us an, a sort of reason to show an ad. So people, we discovered that, that people, or there was a hypothesis. The click-through rate was pretty low. So the hypothesis was that people are might not click because they think that it will cancel the download of the game. So, OK, so you know, what can the test be? Well, let's add a text. You know, clicking an ad will not you know, interrupt download. Right there. Tested it with real users in real setting. And, uh, and then measure. And yes, the click-through rates went up because apparently, I mean, it could be for some other reason, but it would seem fairly obvious that people were anxious that, oh, I don't know if I, I better not touch this. Now it's loading. OK, so basically, and one more thing about this is pay attention to what is not happening. That's the Sherlock Holmes rule, you know. <laughs> the dog wasn't barking, right? Remember, what is not happening is, can be equally important as what actually did happen. So in your testing. And of course, that's part of the whole hypothesis design. And then, like we were talking about before, uh, that was mentioned. Uh, you, either, you can either validate a hypothesis and add that to your body of knowledge. Okay, now we, now we think we know these based on this a little more, the, the sort of uh, user behavior. Or if it's invalidated, make sure to store that also. No, this is not true. 
you know, it, it, it appears it's not how we thought. That's equally important, just to remember. Uh, also record that as knowledge. And then if you want to avoid uh, when somebody leaves the company and takes all that knowledge with them, so just document it. What are the best practices of stuff, okay? Then about uh, metrics and key performance indicators, they can be really destructive if not sensibly set. Uh, I talk to a lot of people, and I think it's great, and I hear a lot of stuff, and I see a lot of stuff, and I'm sometimes scared at how some KPIs that are used are not necessarily the ones that would bring value to the ultimate goal, being a good user experience or a good business at the end of the day. So if we look at this, DAO, which is daily active users, which is very, a very sort of common metric in mobile games at least, um, and then downloads from native apps. And then here we have activity delta, which is a bit difficultly put, and then churn. Churn is when people you know, leave. So let's look at the first up there, uh, daily active users versus downloads. I see time, time, time and time again uh, developers of apps talking about, oh, we have 70,000 downloads. Yes, but if you really look at it, which requires a special SDK, which is a bit of a, a, an extra hassle, uh, you have only 2,000 active users. That means 68,000 users have left the app. It wasn't apparently that good if you, are, if you seek retention, if you seek continuous use. If you seek just that people download the app, you know, pay two euros and then have fun with it for five minutes and never come back, that's fine. Then downloads is a good, good indicator. But if you look at downloads and not focus on the actual utility of the app, it's, it really leads you off in development of it. Okay, so that's what, what is called a vanity metric. Okay, that's probably nothing new to most of you. Uh, then uh, we touched upon leading and lagging indicators before. So churn is a typical lagging indicator. Churn means that somebody left. It's like they got angry and left. Okay, cool, now what? We have no touch point to them anymore. Something much more valuable would be a leading indicator. This person s uh, shows behavior that indicates that he or she might be leaving soon, right? That would be better, so if you're a restaurant owner, Looking at people who left, well, they're gone. But if you're looking at them looking angry because they're not getting served, that's a leading indicator of churn, of, of you know, somebody leaving, right? OK, standard concepts, probably. Uh, so you should really pay attention to, or put a lot of effort into what KPIs you set. And then I would uh, suggest that you state high-level KPIs. Those are the ones that are fairly static. They can be related to the growth phase of your whatever you're building. And uh, I put some book references at the end if you want to read more, unless you have read about you know, the, the sticky engine, viral engine, and paid engine, and these ways of thinking about growth stages. At some stage, you might want to really optimize for stickiness so that you have a concept that works before you start scaling it. So it's phase de dependent. But still, those should be fairly static, I would, I would recommend. And then a bunch of tools that you try out stuff and measure how we can impact. So basically. Try to make the motorcycle go fast, and then you have a bunch of tools to tweak with things. OK. So accessible tools. Um, one single point. One tool that is actually used is much more valuable than a complex, kick-ass tool that is not. And this is very often the case that you have all these sophisticated systems, and then nobody uses them because they don't have access to them, or they don't know about them, or they don't, can, cannot use them. So you know, sometimes this is better. So, the point is that make sure that everybody has access, really seamless access. It can be a simple thing as putting the password in, we use pass packet games, so everybody has shared passwords, it's really convenient. So that you don't need to run around and ask somebody, oh, I need access to case metrics, what's our password? Okay, so really like simple things. A lot of this stuff is really simple things at the end of the day. Okay, and then shared goals. And this is really sort of the benefit of, of this thinking. Uh, a lot of times there's a disconnect or even conflict of goals if set at what you might call function level. You might have a product manager, like in this case, who has a goal. Your job is to optimize daily active users. And then we have a business manager whose goal might be to optimize visit ERPM, effective revenue per mil, meaning basically how much money we make. And typically in this setup, there's a sort of trade-off. You might have excellent user experience, which means basically no ads. Or then you might have something that you really need to unwrap the whole thing before you get to the content that you wanted. Yeah, you may get lots of money here for a while, and then users churn. Or then uh, you create a great user experience, but you need to make money still. 
So in order to avoid the situation where you might have, have to sort of tweak the whole mixer table of, oh, let's downsize that and like emphasize this and set goals at a high enough level so that they are truly shared, really. Make sure that, the, that everybody works towards something that is in everybody's benefit. Now, it's easy ideologically to say that, but it really works at least in a, in a sort of setting of our size. OK, so basically, the temple again. This is how I see data-driven culture in context, what it's needed and what it's about. And I'll spend uh, the last of the time on some quick examples of uh, key concepts that we have used. And th these will be really like basic stuff. OK, so A-B testing. Now, you might want to have a look at that bird. And once you're done contemplating how that experience might make you feel, we could talk about the box. This is our main driver of traffic from Ilta Sanomat, the front page, which is the biggest website in Finland, to our main gaming service. So this is, we have full control of that, what we do with it. And the point is that we measure how well it sort of works, how it appeals, how people click, through click-through rate, mentioned many times. Here we have the index and the timeline. Basically, through systematic, continuous probing, trying, you might call it A-B testing, but systematic, it's about incremental change, small improvements. It's not about leaps. It's usually about really tweaking and tweaking and really keeping tweaking, and it will be better. And this is how we have improved the index, basically, uh, to two and a half times in a year, if you look at the timeline. So that's one thing. It really, continuously just grinding. It will become better. This is uh, from banner design, creative design. This doesn't. Uh, this isn't about, you know, this is display banners, so no titles or, or anything like that. So the point here is basically that we saw uh, with some of the numbers that, that Jana showed uh, was that seemingly small improvements can have a very big impact. You might improve through all this testing, and this, is, this might look like a, we just blast all sorts of stuff and, and see what works. No, it's really planned, you know, mm -hmm. color versus color, sign of trust, Apple Store now and character versus not, and it's really like, that's kind of the sort of solution of that test. Now, we, we do, when you have like impressions in the millions, you can actually draw conclusions about what works. So my point is that you have managed to, from the mean to the best, improve click-through rate by 0 0.12 percentage points, which might seem like useless, but no, that's a 25% increase right there. Meaning you spend 25%, no, it means you, basically you get 25% more customers. It doesn't mean 25% less spend. But roughly, you get the point. OK, and this is how it looked in practice. This is from our office, from the wall. It's fun to do stuff real, like analogy, you know, really stickers sometimes. OK, and next time, retention, quickly. Um, a typical metric, this is daily active users. Uh, might look like this. It might look healthy. This is from actual data from one of our services that we uh, have some problems with. And uh, this is why. If you look, oh, the amount of retained users is really small. Every day, it seems that, yeah, if you look at this, we're doing fine. But no, yeah, we're not retaining the users. And this is why. If you look at retention and day one, day two, day seven retention, this requires special tools. Google Analytics doesn't really allow this uh, yet. They have cohort analysis and stuff like that. But this really requires special tools. This is from Omnia, that one, of, one of the things we use. So we can see that on the day one, which is day zero, is the first day the user came. Day one is the next day, whatever day that is. So that makes a cohort. So you can see user sort of life uh, cycle, independent of time. Only 6% come back. So basically, this is like a sieve that doesn't really catch the leaves too well, right? OK, this is a, a game, uh, one of our best performing games, that has a flow. It has sort of when you level up, you continue. And uh, I'll just quickly run through what we do. We go through day one retention, day seven retention. We have all the uh, users, and we can see where they are. We can build it sort of at the next level so that they, it doesn't take too much time to get to the next level and so forth. Here are, here's the retention uh, numbers for that. Now compare that. Uh, after 90 days, after three months, we have more users still using the game than in the first example after one day. So if you are designing stuff that, that you want to retain users, em emphasize repeat use, you really need to focus on retention. OK, lifetime value, um, it's really insightful to be able to somehow roughly predict the lifetime value of things before, so b b based on user behavior. I won't go too much detail into that. You can look it up on SlideShare and, and send me a note later if you want. 
And then quickly about Liga Persi, which is our biggest game, paid game. We really have quick gains about improvements. So that's the game. And uh, here's how we have set up. This is our sort of what we want to do. My, my point is that it's really staged. We have different focus on different phases of the game. And uh, these are our desired user behaviors. These are what people are uh, trying to do. And our best job is to try to help them actually accomplish that. And then how we've set it up is th these are our sort of static metrics that we optimize on, and these are our tools. And a quick, to quick point about those tools, Google Analytics with custom dimensions powered by hashed user IDs is super powerful. If you have a service that you have registered users, meaning you can identify everyone and shoot that hash to Google, that's awesome, really, because you get to the level of, <laughs> oh, here are some books, and uh, that's me. OK. Thank you, Olaf. Thank you. That's pretty awesome work. I mean, uh, it seems that uh, at least the Sonoma Games is not giving any head uh, for Veikkaus in terms of analytical competence here. Um, so uh, we can take one or two questions from the audience if any arise. And meanwhile, Sami can come up here and uh, we can ha Andy helps you kind of prepare. Do we have any questions? Or, or is everything clear? I can uh, then make one question while uh, we see if uh, I can get the audience more engaged. Um, you started by talking about this uh, data-driven culture. Um, what do you think, uh, how much time have you had to spend in order to build that? That's a very, oh, oh sorry, I removed the mic already, yeah. So that, that's a very relevant question. And I, I'll be frank about it. It really takes time. And I wasn't even part of initiating this. Uh, but we've been working like this now for years. And I would say during the last two years, we've been seeing really progress. And when I see progress, I mean, when I see a guy that proactively goes and asks somebody else, what is this number so that I can calculate whether I should do this or that with my product, including monetization and everything, then I'm really happy. Then I'm, I'm, I think that we have really, we have a bit of a data-driven culture. And how have you been able to spread that culture outside of your autonomous teams? That's the next awesome question. And that's, that's my personal quest. I'm really thrilled about this. This, uh, this whole data-driven culture th thing. And uh, we have this at Games, and I, that, that I uh, showed you in the beginning. Games is a very sort of separate unit. And uh, my sort of big question is, how can you, assuming that this is a way that would work at scale, how can you scale that? And I've talked to a lot of companies that are pretty good at it, with, let's say, 300 people or so. And, uh, and also SC5, our partners in development. So that's really sort of what I'm interested in, but that's not something I can really sort of comment on based on, on experience. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I think now it's time to give a final hand to you.